there are options, and that's why we need to take this opportunity seriously. There's no way you can prevent global warming unless China is part of the solution. This is not normal male behavior. This is predatory behavior. We don't know how bad this bug is. We don't know what this bug does. All of that was thrown away in those eight minutes and 46 seconds, and that's the moment that I became an abolitionist. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Welcome to The Monk Debates. Every episode, we provide you with a civil and substantive debate on the big issue of the day to arm you, the listener, with enough information to make up your own mind. Today's debate, be it resolved, John Carpenter, not David Cronenberg, is the true master of modern horror. On this island, in this building, through this door, down this hallway, lies the most frightening experience of your life. Prepare yourself for they came from within. weird and pissed off, whatever it is. Bennings, go get Childs. What is this? What's, the kind of- What's going on? What's the kind of- hey, Bobber, what is it? I don't know. Wait. Childs! Mac wants the flamethrower. Mac wants the what? That's what he said. Now move! Damn it. Hello, I'm your moderator, Rudyard Griffiths. Halloween, Shivers, The Thing, The Fly. These are some of the most iconic titles in the world of horror movies. You, like me, may have visceral memories of these films and remember the fear they inspired. I know I can't forget Michael Myers stalking Lori through quiet suburbia or Seth slowly transforming into a horrible human fly, losing his sanity in the process. The films of John Carpenter and David Cronenberg have elevated the genre of the horror flick to the realm of high art, making us all think as well as feel. They continue to terrify audiences and inspire creators decades after their release. But only one can be crowned the true master of modern horror. Among aficionados, fellow directors, and film scholars, many hold Carpenter in the highest esteem for his ability to create fear from the mundane, ordinary, and believable. His use of music to create an unparalleled sense of tension An atmosphere of impending doom is unmatched. For many, Carpenter is the true master of modern horror, and all others are swimming in his wake. 100 years ago, between midnight and one, something evil came out of the fog. Now it has returned. Who's there? The fog. Antonio Bay has a curse on it. Only Carpenter can make us afraid of something as universal as the weather, as in the case of The Fog. But another camp of horror fans respectfully disagrees. David Cronenberg's intricate weave of psychological and physical horrors create dynamic, challenging, and thought-provoking films that have expanded the definition of the genre. They argue that no other director has done more to push horror into the future permanently redefining what we fear, the media, our bodies, our very sense of our own sanity. We'll be the ultimate family. A family of three joined together in one body. More human than I am alone. On this installment of The Monk Debates, we aim to discover what it means to be afraid by debating the motion, be it resolved, John Carpenter, not David Cronenberg, is the true master of modern horror. Arguing for the motion is Paul Tremblay, horror superfan and award-winning author of Survivor Song, The Cabin at the End of the World, Disappearance at Devil's Rock, and A Head Full of Ghosts. Arguing against the motion is Noel Carroll, professor of philosophy at the SUNY Graduate Center, specializing in the contemporary philosophy of art and film. He's the author of the bestseller, The Philosophy of Horror. Paul Knoll, welcome to The Monk Debates. Hi, thank you. Well, hello. I'm really looking forward to today's debate. I've got to level with you. Um, 
Horror films scare the you-know-what out of me, and <laughs> traditionally through the course of my life, I've actually kind of avoided them for that very reason. Some early childhood memories I will not relate to you both, but the opportunity to kind of think big about this important genre, this way of imagining our world, imagining our kind of interior fears, our interior depths with the two of you, given your extensive knowledge, interest, and insights is just a a pleasure indeed. So I'm really looking forward over the next uh, 45 minutes together to learn, um, to understand our motion today, because it's one I've thought of a lot. You know, who really is the modern master of horror? Uh, we're putting it forward today that it's John Carpenter, not David Cronenberg, uh, who is that true master of modern horror. Paul, you're arguing in favor of of the motion. So as per debate convention, we're going to put a couple minutes on our proverbial show clock and turn the microphone over to you. All right. Uh, David Cronenberg, if you're listening, love you, mean it. <laughs> but this is my side here. Anyway, uh, so in Jason Zinneman's excellent book, uh, Shock Value, highly recommended, he argues the birth of the modern horror film occurs in the 1970s. And one of the defining films of that era is, of course, John Carpenter's Halloween. Halloween is not the first slasher, but it is the definitive one, inspiring an entire subgenre of horror that only grows in popularity and, re and relevance, you know, from yet another Halloween reboot that's out in theaters now, including to a couple of recent best-selling slasher novels of Grady Hendrix and, and Stephen Graham Jones. You know, Halloween continues to be, you know, not only relevant, but one of the most relevant films uh, from that period. Uh, then the thing is, uh, you know, I would argue uh, Carpenter's masterpiece. Um, you know, it's one of the greatest horror movies ever made, inspiring you know scores of filmmakers, including you know from Guillermo del Toro to Quentin Tarantino. You know, with those two movies in particular in mind, you know, the look and feel and soundtrack of Carpenter films continue to resonate and to be imitated. You know, much like uh, his Alien and The Thing. In films like Green Room, It Follows, and you know the nearly ubiquitous Stranger Things, where the font, the title show font of Stranger Things is very much lifted directly from Carpenter's title cards from the 80s. Um, and I, would, I guess I would briefly end my opening with, you know, much like Stephen King's enduring popularity, um, I think Carpenter's is similarly rooted, you know, compared to King, uh, rooted in his blue collar protagonists and his versatility within the genre. You know, as we'll, I'm sure we'll discuss, Carpenter tackled many types of horror stories and types of subgenres within the horror story. Thank you, Paul. To the point, focused right on time. I love that as your moderator. Uh, so, Noel, we're going to turn the program over to you. Similar opportunity, two minutes on the clock to give your opening statement arguing against our motion, be it resolved, John Carpenter, not David Cronenberg, Canadian, I might add, is the true master of modern horror. I also want to say that Carpenter is a great, great horror film director. Uh, his version, I agree with Paul, of The Thing is a masterpiece. I think it surpasses the original, which, is, of course, many people think was actually directed by Howard Hawks. David Cronenberg, I want to say, um, is as strong as Carpenter as a cinematic craftsman. But in addition, and this is the crux of my argument, I would say that, that Cronenberg is deeper. His themes are more ambitious. One of his earliest themes, which he pursued throughout his career, focuses on our paradoxical anxiety, our paradoxical horror about our own embodiment, our revulsion, our disgust at having bodies, at having fleshy hardware, of being vulnerable. Plague and infection, of course, are the, the themes of his early films, Shivers and Ra Rabid, uh, the correlation of birth and abomination in the brood, uh, of biological change in the, in the fly. Uh, and, and Cronenberg further explores this horror of the body uh, in terms of our being embodied across various modalities. Maybe the most interesting is his explorations of the examination of the body in, in media, in films like Videodrome and Extends, uh, where he explores how the media, um, video games and TVs get control of us through our bodies and its desires, and from there take control of our minds and, and make us captives. The mind, of course, especially in terms of its darker dimensions, is also a recurring theme in Cronenberg. 
uh, and another source of the horror we take in our own very nature. So uh, the theme that Cronenberg explores uh, in various dimensions is this paradox that what most horrifies us are the features that make us human, not aliens from outer space, not insects as big as garages, but our own creature nature, our own creaturehood, uh, our bodies and the dark resources of our minds. So I think in virtue of this profound theme, it, that gives Cronenberg an, an edge in this competition, albeit a competition between two giants. Thank you, Noel. You know, a terrific debate is when your moderator is thoroughly undecided at this point. Um, you both have made really convincing and interesting arguments. So I'm looking forward to drilling deeper into some of your key points. But before we do that, let's have some rebuttal. So, Paul, your opportunity to react to Noel here. Let's put a couple minutes on our show clock and have you spark off Noel's opening statement. Yeah, no. So I, I'm in total agreement with Noel in terms of, I mean, my love of of, of Cronenberg for one thing. And the idea of how Cronenberg is obsessed with, I guess, the shorter sort of parlance would be body horror. So, and in a way, like, I, I would never say that's a weakness of Cronenberg, but, you know, for the purposes of this debate, you know, Cronenberg sort of leans into that obsession and speaking as a writer who leans into his own obsession. I admire that. But the thing, you know, that I continue to be impressed by with, with Carpenter is sort of there's more of the depth or breadth of, of the different genres within horror. Horror is this expansive thing. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, you know, Carpenter really sort of created the slasher film. You know, we can talk about how the thing is really almost, a, not almost, it, it very much is a body horror film, very, very Cronenbergian, at least in terms of uh, the effects that happen to the body within that story. But it also goes in, I would say, even deeper into, into the themes of identity and who are you really. With The Fog, Carpenter did the classic ghost story. He's done a King adaptation. His Prince of Darkness sort of harkens back to uh, Hammer Horror and homage to Quatermass in the Pit. Assault on Precinct 13 is a siege horror film. And In the Mouth of Madness is, uh, is, is clearly a Lovecraftian, but also a very metafictional uh, story. I think all of those movies, <laughs> it took, it took uh, at least a decade or two for some people to catch up with them. And the thing I continually am impressed by with Carpenter is sort of that versatility Whereas I, I think there's no doubt that Cronenberg probably on a film by film basis makes better films, but he continually mines sort of that same obsession of his. But if we're going to talk like the greater impact within the larger society, I think, you know, so many people, one, don't like horror. And then body horror is like an even further edge out into the, oh, there's no way I could do that. I don't know if Cronenberg's had the same impact as Carpenter. Thank you. Paul. Now, Noel, similar opportunity for you to react to Paul's opening statement or what you've just heard now. I would agree that Paul is right, that within within the area or the domain of horror, Carpenter's explored more widely. But of course, in terms of a, a general palette, uh, I think the argument is actually that Cronenberg has gone much further uh, in terms of uh, films like uh, Cosmopolis, Crash, uh, I mean, he's tackled literary classics or neo neo classics. Um, so, in, in in one sense, I think we both have have to agree that both of these directors have reached not only within horror uh, but in general. I mean, think of Carpenter's Escape films, to uh, Escape from New York, etc. Uh, brilliant films. Um, I think uh, that one thing uh, that I especially admire about Carpenter is he's very efficient. You know, he is Hawksian. Um, I guess I would say in the same uh, way that I respect Hitchcock uh, as being deeper than Hawks, although both of the masters, I would, would still want to rate Cronenberg higher. Um, one interesting thing, I think, and maybe we want to focus a little on this, is that Cronenberg and Carpenter both made Stephen King adaptations in the same year, 1983. Mm. Uh, and in fact, Cronenberg had Carpenter's usual uh, producer, Debbie Hill, uh, on his. And I would argue that though they're both very good uh, adaptations, um, superior adaptations of Stephen King, Cronenberg's Dead Zone is better than Carpenter's Christine. Who? Your mother. No, that is not possible, John. She survived. John, my mother is dead. She's alive. I know her name. I know where she lives. There's a kind of sadness, uh, a kind of sense of loss that's not really that 
evident in the king and gives it just a, a, an emotional depth. Christine doesn't have. I mean, the characters in, uh, have all the right emotions to make the plot work. It's very efficient. But, uh, and I, I'll come back to this theme, I, I think that Cronenberg is, is deeper emotionally. Also, going back to what Paul said, there's no body horror in Dead Zone. <laughs> Well, great. Now I get to join the conversation. I want to just pull back the camera lens a little bit and have both of you talk to us, uh, you know, an audience who is listening to you and understanding, you know, the sophistication, the nuance of your analysis of, of these films, of these directors. So I want to learn a bit more about how you define uh, modern horror. What is the genre that we're talking about? Because that's at the heart of our resolution. One of these two men, Carpenter or Cronenberg, is the master of modern horror. That's what we're asserting. So I want to understand a little more about what this genre is and why you think it's so kind of culturally important to interpreting and understanding our, our society and who we are. So, Paul, maybe I could start with you. The working definition of horror that I use, or the horror films and books that I enjoy and the ones that I try to write, I like to think of a horror film or a horror story as it's, there's a reveal of a terrible truth. I mean, that, that's any work of art. There's going to be a reveal or a communication of a truth. And obviously, typically in a horror story, that reveal is, is horrific. It's a reveal of a terrible truth. Um, and it could be personal, societal, universal, or, or as Noel was talking about, in particular to Cronenberg, that, that reveal is usually you know dealing with the revulsion of the body, and I think Carpenter tends to, to bounce around in those different reveals, like in They Live, which we could argue is a horror movie or not, is more sort of societal, whereas a thing is very much a personal reveal of a terrible truth. And I would end by just, I'm just talking in general for, for a horror story. For me, my favorite kind of horror stories have that reveal of this terrible truth about two thirds of the way through, or, or certainly not at the end. Um, and I'm always most interested in them. What do these characters do now? You know, now that they know this terrible thing or this terrible thing has been exposed, what are the what are the decisions they're going to make? You know, how do they live through this? How does anybody live through this? And to me, that's what really excites me about horror is getting at those most difficult questions in really interesting ways. You know, and I, uh, obviously I think Carpenter and Cronenberg both do a very good job at getting at those questions. Thanks, Paul. So, Noel, I mean, this is an interesting question for you. I mean, you're the author of a book, The Philosophy of Horror. So you've thought long and deeply about this. I mean, what is modern horror? How... Paul's saying it's it's the revelation of a of a terrible truth. I, I can see that. I can see how a lot, certainly a lot of horror films work that way. Help us understand this genre so we can understand your contesting views as to which one of these two directors, these two auteurs, is the preeminent master of horror in our time. Rather than try and give a, a, a conceptual or a thematic account of modern horror the way uh, Paul just did, I, I would like to suggest a, a historical approach. I think that, that modern horror starts when those, uh, let's call them baby boomers, uh, when those baby boomers had the opportunity to return to these great stories and this great genre of their, their childhood. And I can tell you, because I'm the same age they are, that we had it really tough. We had it really tough. Uh, kids nowadays have it easy. They they have horror films on every channel. Uh, <laughs> they've got monsters uh, in everything, uh, you know, from Harry Potter to high school witches and vampire killers. We had to really work. We had to convince our parents to stay up, let us stay up at, late at night to watch the universal horror films. We had to be on the lookout when famous monsters from film land arrived in the drugstore, uh, and, and we had to grab it right away before anyone else did. In any case, um, uh, I think that when we came of age and, and came into our ascendancy, we, we used it to create, in the case of King, me, I wrote The Philosophy of Horror. Uh, I wrote it to show my parents that I had it was actually gainfully employed during the whole period when they kept saying to me, do your math homework. 
So I think it was historical, first of all. Uh, one thing about King as a writer is that he has been able to take all of these old genres and old stories, like The Monkey's Poor, and turn them into 350-page uh, novels. He's, he's taken all of that material and certainly given it his own cast uh, with his own obsession with childhood. But he's, he's actually uh, re revived uh, the old old forms. Um, now, I wouldn't want to deny that there are certain um, um, new genres, uh, paranormal activity, etc. Uh, now, but um, modern genre is just, uh, uh, I, I think, a replay and an imaginative re expansion of the older genre, which has always been about violations of the familiar. Hi, Rudyard Griffiths here, your host and moderator. I have a favor to ask you. Please consider becoming a Monk member. Membership is free and you get access to a series of great benefits, including a 10 plus year library of some of our best debates, dialogues, and podcasts. You also get a free monthly newsletter featuring the debates that we're watching around the world. And you get a specially curated Friday weekly Monk Members Only podcast that focuses on the big international events and trends shaping our world. All of that, again, free at www.monkdebates.com. I hope you'll consider joining and becoming part of our community. Now, back to our program. So, no, that's where I wanted to go next, which is to have both of you kind of argue for your respective champion in this debate. Uh, Noel, you're arguing for David Cronenberg as the true master of horror versus Paul, who's arguing for John Carpenter. So what, you know, if we throw another definition out there that, you know, part of art's function, its value, its role is to reflect ourselves back upon ourselves, to illuminate our interior depths, to reveal ourselves to ourselves. Talk to us a little bit more about what you think Cronenberg shows us in that in the mirror of his creativity what do we see and why do you think that that is something of enduring value and importance i suppose that we want to think about this on two levels uh, what the horror uh, film reveals about us as individuals and and also what it reveals to us about ourselves as as societies i mean a, a lot of discussion of uh, horror film which is not something I particularly admire is the idea um, that at, at certain times uh, of crisis, uh, certainly the horror genre explodes. I, I think that's just empirically false. You know, we, we've had a straight run of, of horror as, as a kind of leading genre since Polanski's Rosemary Baby and The Exorcist. I mean, it's mm -hmm. been unrelenting uh, through bad years. And I mean, some people thought the Reagan years were great. Uh, <laughs> uh, horror uh, uh, flourished through that, um, through recession and inflation, through uh, good times and, and bad. It, it just doesn't seem to go away. So I, I'm very suspicious of the, the social interpretations of, of horror. I, I think, as uh, Paul was saying, that that uh, it's much more important to um, uh, uh, focus on, on on what horror reveals about us. And I think that one thing that Cronenberg wants to confront us with is the kind of uh, um, uh, horror we may t have or have toward our own bodies, to towards our own human conditions. Now, again, I don't think that's a modern theme. I think if you go back to H.P. Lovecraft, that you find this horror of being uh, human and it, it is, is a perennial uh, theme in horror. Um, but I think that it's one that is dealt with a certain level of sophistication in Cronenberg. Again, le let me say two major uh, cases, uh, two of his great films, Videodrome and Extends. Uh, those, those both seem to me uh, to be asking us to think about uh, uh, our, our relationship to the media, uh, but not in terms of, of the way we usually think about it, in terms of uh, short attention spans, but rather in terms of how what the media addresses directly is, is our body. <laughs> It 
takes control of our body. We tend to think of it as, as a matter of uh, uh, engaging our mind. But of course, our body is, is the site of desire. And that's what the media actually uses as its leverage in terms of entering our souls. Thank you, Noel. So, Paul, I mean, I'm sympathetic to what Noel is saying here, that if you if you want to look at a 21st century kind of visionary creating films in the in the final decades of the previous century, you really turn, don't you, to David Cronenberg to kind of reveal our future selves to us in the past? I mean, there's something quite remarkable about the themes that he touches on in his horror, uh, genetic engineering, what Videodrome and, this, and the, the influences of, of media and technology on ourselves. Isn't this just at a level of sophistication and kind of cultural perspicacity that outstrips John Carpenter and kind of leaves him more as an entertainer than a true auteur of horror? Wow, that's a hard question. I, I mean, there's no denying that, you know, so many of Cronenberg's movies are certainly speaking to our technological age, if not our technological us. But I think, you know, as much as I love Cronenberg, what I would argue is that he is often missing out on character depth. You know, that said, you know, uh, Noel rightly brought up that, you know, the dead zone in particular, there was a, you know, depth of character and emotion. And it's kind of interesting to me that Cronenberg's two films in which you actually felt for the characters, and I say that with a little bit of humor, were both adaptations, uh, The Dead Zone and The Fly, or a remake in that case. In both those times, you know, Cronenberg did, you know, imbue it with an emotional power that was lasting, but which is really sort of missing for most of his other movies. You know, not to say that I don't like those films. It'd be like the same thing with J.G. Ballard, who's often, often purposely cold. I think Cronenberg mm-hmm. is purposely cold. And I think that while Carpenter was not necessarily going after our sort of technological present and technological future, I do think that his themes still resonate you know, today, for viewers who go back to it today. So for example, you know, I think I'd mentioned in my intro that I think one thing that people continually go back to, to Carpenter for are sort of the blue collar, quote unquote, everyday representations of his protagonists, like the babysitter and we'll go all the way back to Halloween, the babysitter in Halloween, you know, she has to work and make money, whereas, you know, her friends don't and they're out partying. You know, the heroes of the thing are, are sort of the grunts, you know, the the helicopter, you know, uh, pilot, the, the the kitchen workers, not the doctors and the scientists. Um, and, you know, they live, which I know is sort of skirting the line of, is this horror? Is this not horror? You know, they live features, uh, you know, not a, a homeless drifter, sort of caught in a consumerist Reagan. And if you watch it now, very Trumpian nightmare. You know, so I, I do think we see, we can see the themes of today in, in the works of Carpenter's past, even though he's not as obsessed with, you know, where, Technology is taking not only our bodies, but our, but ourselves. But, you know, I would even argue, and maybe this is a little bit of, you know, viewing the, the movie in our time now, but, you know, In the Mouth of Madness is all about, like, alternate reality, not only shaping who we are, but, but, but changing who we are. I mean, it's hard not to watch In the Mouth of Madness now and think of, you know, social media and how that's really rewriting our own novels, you know, as, as we live through them. So, no, different question for you, which is, you know, to build on Paul's argument here, you know, the, the carpenter is the the everyman's horatician. I don't know if that's a word or an illogism that I've just made up, but of course you like David Cronenberg. You're an intellectual. He's an intellectual. We can, you know, uh, find our favorite rabbit hole together and go down it. And what's really powerful about Carpenter's work is its its ability to do the thing that sets out a true master of modern horror, which is to scare your living pants off. And Carpenter is just better at that than David Cronenberg. Now, in terms of uh, the who scares the bejesus out of us more, uh, I'd say, look, horror is composed of at least two components. One is fear and the other is disgust. Um, that's what makes <laughs> horror different than uh, a thriller about, uh, say, uh, just a serial killer. Horror has has a disgust component. And if Carpenter scares the bejesus out of you, Cronenberg uh, disgusts the bejesus out of you. Uh, <laughs> he, he, is, he is the master of, uh, of, of disgust. Now, I do think that he, he scares you, but also I think that he gets your skin to crawl and the chills to go up and down your spine in terms of revulsion more. So, Paul, come back on that, because that's, you know, a really interesting way to look at uh, 
Mm-hmm. Look at Cronenberg, and you, you just think of Jeff Goldblum when he's coming out of the uh, transporter machine and the fly, and the pieces are, of his body are beginning to shed, and the DNA of the fly is asserting itself. I mean, it's there is a lot of disgust there that draws you along. It's interesting. You know, it's funny because when I write, like, I don't think of horror in terms of disgust. That's not to say, you know, Noel is incorrect. I mean, obviously people talk about that frequently, you know, and weirdly I might be, I don't know if I'm arguing anybody's point here, but I don't define how, I mean, my own sort of working definition of horror doesn't really rely on the scare to me. Like it really sort of annoys me. Like, you know, if it's online or social, just, you know, noise where it's like, Oh, that movie wasn't scary. It's not horror. Like, well, I mean, I don't know. That's not the definition of horror to me. I mean, for one, the scare is so subjective. What's going to scare you or Noel might be different than what scares me. Just like, you know, humor is so subjective. I think we can intellectually sort of recognize, oh, this is supposed to be scary. So I don't know. For me, like as a writer, I tend to focus on, you know, what is disturbing, you know, or what is sort of dread inducing. I think those are things that are a little bit more in my control. You know, insofar as as Carpenter and Cronenberg, I, I do think, you know, I think at Cronenberg's best, and at Carpenter's best, it's so hard to, to distinguish the two because then they, they have both. They have the disgust and the, and the emotional depth to it, you know, like in The Fly, as, as, as Noel brought up. Um, and if I'm going to go back to maybe the tiebreaker of The Thing to me, yes, The Thing is disgusting and the, and the practical effects by Rob Boutine, which, you know, are mm-hmm. not only ground baking, but continue to be lauded. And, you know, I wish more people would mimic them instead of relying on CGI. But to me, you know, the scariest parts of The Thing are, are the paranoia that ensues in that film. Are you saying to me the dog wasn't put in the kennel until last night? Right. How long were you alone with that dog? I don't know, an hour, hour and a half, maybe. What the hell are you looking at me like that for? That is the part that sticks and lingers with me, you know, more than the disgust. And, you know, there is, I, you know, I'm not, that's not to say that the fly doesn't have any sort of lingering depth there, too. But, you know, in terms of the, yeah, the scare, I don't know, it's sort of all wrapped up with me. And, and typically, for me, it's the characters. And I do think that's sort of the broader the broader reach. You know, I don't know if the broader reach certainly doesn't necessarily equate into what's better, right? We're not going to go with the 10 million Elvis fans. Can't be wrong argument. Before we go to closing statements, Noel, I just want to come back to you on The Thing, because that was a movie that had a, left a big impression on me. And to any of our listeners who've not spent some time with The Thing, you know, Halloween's coming up. There's nothing, frankly, maybe better you could do than find it somewhere on Netflix, Apple TV, or wherever wherever it is. Because isn't there something remarkable about that film, Noel, that, you know, he took on this earlier iconic horror film. In fact, the classic is a fabulous piece of kind of paranoia to watch unto itself. And he improved on it. And just the the starkness of the film, the fine, you know, the sketching of these characters in relief against this Arctic landscape. I mean, surely that film marks Carpenter out as the, the master of horror for his, his time. Well, first of all, he didn't improve on it uh, in, in a, a literal sense. He went back to the original story, Who Goes There, uh, where, the, where the creature does this shape-shifting that was, was dropped out of the late 40s edition. A brilliant move. He deserves, and his scriptwriter uh, deserves all, all of the credit in the, in the world for that. And, and they imagined it, as, as Paul pointed out, with just brilliant ideas. One place that Paul and I really agree on is it's not the scare that counts. Ultimately, and it's not the disgust that counts all by itself, it's the fascination that these imagined creatures and situations hold on us, the way, the way they absorb us. It's this, I mean, and, and if you think of, of that image of the thing uh, towards the end where the, the, mm-hmm. the creature has multiple dogs and everything else, yeah. how dazzling. I certainly just, you know, my mouth falls open every time I, I watched it. And, and I did watch it just about two months ago. But the, the great horror films are the ones that, that the imagination grabs the fascination. We can't take our eyes off of it, even though that's what we want to do. It's not scare and it's not just disgust. The, the disgust uh, also often rivets our attention to things. It's the fascination. And I, I would say that 
Cronenberg, um, some of Cronenberg's Im images rivals and maybe even uh, exceeds uh, the, the work in The Thing. Uh, the Thing, I agree, is, is Carpenter's great achievement. But think of Videodrome, the videos being put into James Wood's body. I've got something I want to play for you. Oh my God! <laughs> Think of uh, Extends uh, discovering a, a gun in a Chinese dinner. I found this in my soup, and I'm very upset. Cronenberg's imagery, uh, the, the visual work is, is just gripping, another word for fascination. Thank you, Noel. Um, Paul, I wonder if you could help me out as moderator here. We're doing this alternating thing. I promised you the last word in this debate, but could I ask you to go first with your closing statement on our resolution today, be it resolved, John Carpenter, who you've been arguing for, not David Cronenberg, is the true master of horror. And man, I just had to, it never worked in, but I wanted to work in my quoting of Nelson Muntz uh, after he, of The Simpsons, after walking out of na Naked Lunch saying, I could think of two things wrong with that title. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that, that's, neither here nor there, but one of my favorite Cronenberg moments. Very good. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, obviously, I mean, hope, hopefully the winner of this debate is horror because both of these filmmakers are, are both, you know, genius filmmakers, I, I think. But, you know, so if I, I am here to argue for Cron, uh, for Carpenter, excuse me, I want to go back to something Noel talked about earlier, the idea of like, which I totally agree with. We talked about like the, the lie that we're fed uh, in real life about living in, in uncertain, you know, now these are uncertain times. The idea of like, oh, when things are bad, horror, you know, does really well. You know, I, I don't know about you all, but like during at the beginning of the pandemic, we would have car commercials and bread commercials or whatever commercials talking about in these uncertain times. You need that loaf of bread that you can rely on. And I, I, I found myself just getting angry. Now, clearly, we were experiencing something a little bit extraordinary. But the idea that we've ever lived in something called certain times is the lie. And that is horror to me. And I think that is carpenter horror. You know, with, with Halloween, he, he really sort of the, the first biggest film, when I say biggest in terms of popularity, popularity, that, you know, really played on the idea that you are not safe in the suburbs. I mean, really, that's what... In a lot of ways, the slasher idea is about like, you know, these, you know, mostly well affluent people, you know, feel like they're safe in the suburbs. And now then this maskless killer comes to town. And then obviously the, the paranoia, the 80s paranoia within the thing, you know, could certainly be, you know, would play as, as well in 2021. You know, the same with the paranoia within in the mouth of madness, you know, to me is an, like a stand in for the age of misinformation that we that we live in. So between that in the the aesthetic that continues you know, not only to inform the films of today, but some of the best horror films made in the last five to 10 years have been clearly influenced by Carpenter, including, I think I mentioned It Follows, but also Ty West's House of the Devil. I mentioned Stranger Things. Even Entertainment Weekly in 2014 hailed Carpenter as that year's most influential filmmaker, despite not having made a film, because there were three or four films that had come out from Adam Wingard and Jeremy Solonier, who, who, who made and continue to make Carpenter-esque movies. So it's very close to me, but I guess I have to go Carpenter. Thank you, Paul. And Noel, uh, you've been arguing against our motion, be it resolved, John Carpenter, not David Cronenberg, is the true master of horror. Wrap this debate up for us. Well, let me let me say by uh, starting with something unfair, <laughs> which is simply that um, I don't think we should count things in terms of influence. You can be historically important and not not be aesthetically great. Now, Carpenter is aesthetically great. Um, that's that's not what I'm claiming. I, I'm I'm being a philosopher. I'm being argumentative. I'm saying the premise that of of influence should not be decisive uh, in in this case. Um, and uh, I, I again will uh, go back to uh, um, the point that I've tried to make before. Both Cronenberg and Carpenter are, in their different ways, excellent cinematic craftspeople. Uh, I, I would actually say, well, it'd be very difficult to make a decision there. Uh, so ultimately, I think we have to look at content. And my argument has been uh, since the beginning that Cronenberg. 
is the deeper cinematic thinker. Well, Paul, Noel, thank you so much for a terrific debate. You know, we've debated on this program ancient Rome versus ancient Greeks, uh, which is the more important contributor to Western civilization. We've debated Beethoven versus Mozart, who is the greatest composer. And now we debated John Carpenter versus David Cronenberg. And as with all those previous debates, I've just I've learned so much about your areas of expertise here, your fascination with the genre of horror, and I think the really significant, important things that come from our reflection on these two directors on this genre about ourselves and about our society as a whole. So on behalf of the Mug Debates community, I just want to thank you both for your time, your consideration, and the thought and effort that you've respectively and individually put into your own work to understand uh, these two great directors and more importantly, just understand the value of horror as uh, as not just a form of entertainment, but a, a form of art uh, that we could all do more to understand and appreciate. So thank you both for your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Rajat. Well, that wraps up today's debate. I want to thank our participants, Paul Tremblay and Noel Carroll. If you have feedback or reflections on what you've just heard, please send us an email to podcast at monkdebates.com. That's M-U-N-K debates with an S dot com. Also a reminder that if you enjoy this podcast, check out our regular weekly Monk members only podcast where we delve into the big issues and ideas shaping the news. You can get that podcast free as part of our basic membership, which is available at www.monkdebates.com. And to listen to more debates on everything from climate change to religion to geopolitics to the future of human progress, you can do that all on our website, monkdebates.com also. And finally, thank you for lending your time and attention to our mission as an organization to bring back the art of public debate one conversation at a time. I'm your host and moderator, Rudyard Griffiths. The Monk Debates are produced by Antica Productions and supported by the Monk Foundation. Jacob Lewis is the producer. Abu Raheja is the associate producer. The Monk Debates podcast is mixed by Kieran Lynch. And the president of Antica Productions is Stuart Cox. Be sure to download and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like us, feel free to give us a five-star rating. Thank you again for listening. Listening.